Hello everybody, welcome back. We are in section 7.3 talking about trigonometric substitution. So um, this topic is going to allow us to um, perform integration on functions that do not currently have any trig but are also not very easily solvable um, by using trig, making a substitution, and then being able to solve it more easily. So we're going to consider integrals that have an integrand of that form there, so the square root of a squared minus x squared, for example. Uh, if we change the variable from x to theta and perform the substitution a times sine of theta, then we can use trig identities to get the following. So we get a squared minus a squared sine squared theta and then we can factor out the a squared so that's a squared times 1 minus sine squared theta which is a squared trig identity right 1 minus sine squared is the same thing as cosine squared which would then just give us a times the absolute value of cosine of theta. So all of a sudden, this complicated integrand that we would have a lot of trouble solving is just a constant times a cosine function. And we could then integrate that and then try to work back our substitution using trig properties. This type of substitution is called inverse substitution. So inverse substitution, uh, because we are putting x in terms of theta instead of u in terms of x. So it's inverse substitution because we're going a little backwards. Because in a u substitution, right, you have some function of x, and then you use the u to get rid of all the x's. In this case, I'm putting x in terms of some other function of theta, and then using that to simplify and then go back to x when we're done. Okay, so it's a little bit a little bit backwards from how we've worked in the past, but um, here are the most common substitutions that we're going to encounter. So we're looking at expressions that have these forms, so square root of a squared minus x squared, a squared plus x squared, and x squared minus a squared. And we're going to use these following substitutions for those. So a sine, a tangent, and a secant. We do have restrictions on the domain here. Um, those restrictions primarily are going to be used so that we don't have to deal with these absolute value bars on these functions because if I restrict the domain then I know that I don't have to worry about those possible negatives coming out. Okay? And then a corresponding identity that will be useful um, in using these. So. All right, so that's kind of our setup. So let's go ahead and just try a bunch of examples of this. So evaluate the integral of the square root of 9 minus x squared all over x squared dx. So to start us off, we're going to let x equal, so notice the form that this one has. So it has this form, right, like a squared minus x squared. So that means we're going to use a sine theta. So you need to recognize what a is in this problem. If that's a squared, then a must be 3, because 3 squared is 9. So x is 3 sine theta. Okay, and this is, again, just add that descriptor that limits where theta is. So theta is between negative pi over 2 and pi over 2. Then dx okay, is just the derivative, so that's 3 cosine theta d theta. Okay, so it's the same idea as a u substitution, right? Getting the u du. This time we're just getting x and dx in terms of that new variable theta. Okay, so once we have that, let's go ahead and do the conversion of this. So let me do it in a different color so that we can separate it mentally a little bit. So 9 minus x squared, take the square root, 
So do the substitution. That's going to be 9 minus 9 sine squared theta. Right, or it would be it would be three sine theta quantity squared, but I'll just distribute the square right away. Factor out the nine. We're left with one minus sine squared theta, which of course that's nine times cosine squared theta, which is three times the absolute value of cosine of theta which is actually just 3 cosine of theta. And the reason that we can drop those absolute value bars is because of that domain, that restriction, that theta must be between negative pi over 2 and pi over 2. That keeps all the cosine values positive, so we don't have to worry about those. Okay. So now, using this information, I now know what the numerator is going to be, and the denominator is x squared, but we already know what x is in terms of theta, so let's make the substitution. So we're going to have, so integral of the square root of 9 minus x squared over x squared dx. So this is uh, integral of 3 cosine of theta over 9 sine squared theta and then dx becomes 3 cosine theta d theta. So 3 cosine theta d theta. Okay. So let's simplify. So combine terms where we can. So that's 9 cosine squared theta over 9 sine squared theta d theta. The nines cancel, so we're just left with cosine squared over sine squared, and cosine squared over sine squared is another trig function that's cotangent squared of theta. Okay, and then and this is another one of the trig identities. You probably don't remember this one quite as well, um, but this one is actually the same thing as cosecant squared of theta minus 1 d theta. Okay, so it's again another one of those trig identities kind of like the ones up here the sine, with sine squared and cosine squared, tangent squared, secant squared. Well cotangent squared and cosecant squared are also related to each other. Okay, and now this we can take the antiderivative of. Um, you might not recall the antiderivative of cosecant squared, but that is one that you would learn in a Calc 1 class. It's actually negative cotangent of theta minus the antiderivative of 1 would be x, but in this case the variable is theta, so minus theta plus c. Okay, so once we get to that point now, we've gotten an antiderivative, which is great, except the problem is written in terms of x. So just like with a u substitution where you would need to turn it back into x's again, same thing here. I need to turn these theta values back into x values. The problem is it's not quite as straightforward because my substitution is for sine of theta, not for cotangent of theta or for just theta by itself. So we're going to need to come up with a different way of, uh, of converting this back. Okay, so I'm just going to write this as a little, little note here. So we need to sub back in for x values. Okay. So we have some more information based on that initial substitution. So we know that x equals 3 sine of theta. What I'm going to do is instead of looking at it as x equals, I'm going to solve that for the sine of theta. So since x equals 3 sine theta, sine theta equals x over 3. 
And we know that trig functions are related by uh, triangles, so we're going to use a triangle. Okay, so we're going to use a triangle to do this. So I'll do this in, again, another color. Okay, so we have our right triangle. Oh, let's zoom in a bit here. Okay, there's our angle theta. And we know that sine of theta is x over 3. Now remember back um, to when you first learned trig. So uh, remember SOHCAHTOA, that um, mnemonic for remembering what what sine, cosine, and tangent are equivalent to. Sine is opposite over hypotenuse. So that means the opposite side from theta is x, and the hypotenuse side is 3. Okay. Which means that if we're looking for cotangent of theta, cotangent, that's 1 over tangent of theta. Okay. And tangent of theta is opposite over adjacent, which means that cotangent is adjacent over opposite because it's 1 over the tangent. Okay, so we're looking for the adjacent side over the opposite side. So we'll still need that x, but we also need the adjacent side as well. So we need to find that just using the Pythagorean theorem. Um, so if we get that, it turns out it's familiar. It's actually the square root of 9 minus x squared, right? Because you get um, a squared plus b squared equals c squared. And I'm solving for, say, a squared, so I subtract that over and then take the square root and get a equals the square root of c squared minus b squared. And that's where we would get that value. Okay. So our cotangent of theta, which we said is, because tangent is opposite over adjacent, so cotan cotangent is adjacent over opposite. So nine square root 9 minus x squared over x. And we also need to get uh, theta. So we know that uh, sine of theta is x over 3. So to get theta, we just take the inverse trig function to get rid of that sine. So theta is going to be inverse sine of x over 3. Okay, and that's going to give us the remaining piece that we need. So let me just get rid of this. Okay. So we have a negative square root of 9 minus x squared over x minus inverse sine, inverse sine of x over 3 plus c. And that would be our solution to this integral. Okay, so not obvious at all, right? Not by any means um, that we would get this inverse sine term showing up in here. Um, so this is why the trig functions and the trig identities can be so helpful for us, um, is that it can get us these values using a couple of trig identities, right? A u-substitution equivalent, right? An inverse substitution. Um, and then our knowledge of trig in triangles. So in case you weren't, you weren't aware from the last section that you needed to remember some trig, um, this section will definitely seal that for you. So it's a good idea to brush up on your trig if you haven't done so already. But everything that you've just seen us do here, um, that's pretty much the extent of what you would need to know for this section. Um, and we're going to do some more examples so you'll see you know, the same kinds of things just with different trig functions. So let's move on to the next example. 
So find the integral of 1 over x squared times the square root of x squared plus 4. Okay, so we need to come up with our substitution. So look at the form of the radical. So x squared plus 4. So that's going to, if we go back up here, that's going to be this one. Right? So that's going to be x equals a times tangent of theta. So we're going to let x equal 2 tangent of theta from negative pi over 2 to pi over 2, okay. uh, or not equal to, sorry about that. That's strict because tangent doesn't exist at the pi over 2's. Okay, and then our dx value is going to be 2 times derivative of tangent, which is secant squared of theta d theta. <clears throat> and then let's do our substitution. So square root of x squared my, uh, plus 4. That's going to be 4 tangent squared theta plus 4. So square root of 4 times tangent squared theta plus 1. So we're going to get, uh, this is 4 secant squared theta. So this becomes 2 times absolute value of secant theta. And again, we can drop the absolute value bars because of that domain restriction. So because of the domain restriction, we know we're going to get a positive value, so we can just get rid of the absolute value there. Okay, so now let's go ahead and do the substitution. So we have integral of 1 over x squared times square root of x squared plus 4 dx. So we get integral 1 over uh, x squared, that's going to be 4 tangent squared theta times the, uh, excuse me, just times 2 secant theta. And then the dx value, that's times 2 secant squared theta d theta. Okay, and then let's simplify as much as we can. So notice I have a 2 here, a 2 here. I have two copies of secant up here, one down here, so those are all going to cancel. And what I have left, I have one secant left in the numerator, I have my tangent squared, and I have my 4. I'm going to go ahead and pull out the 1 fourth, because it's not, it's not going to hurt anything, just hanging out outside there. So this becomes 1 fourth times the integral of secant of theta over tangent squared of theta d theta. <clears throat> now to evaluate this integral, um, oftentimes when dealing with the secants and the tangents and more complicated trig functions like this, it can be helpful um, to put everything in terms of sine and cosine. Okay? And so that's what we're actually going to do here. So uh, to evaluate, put everything in terms of sine and cosine. <clears throat> okay. So let me just do this as a, a side note over here. Okay, so we have secant theta over tangent squared theta secant theta is 1 over cosine so that's 1 over cosine theta over tangent is sine over cosine so sine squared theta over cosine squared theta so write that as a product of the reciprocals so 1 over cosine times cosine squared over sine squared and you get a cancellation of one factor of cosine so we're left with 
cosine theta over sine squared theta. <clears throat> so, let's go ahead and just write this out. So, oops, I forgot my one fourth already. So, don't forget to bring down the one fourth as you're going. Uh, this is the integral of cosine theta over sine squared theta, d theta. And now this is something we can solve using one of our other techniques, and that is a u substitution. So notice we have two copies of sine here. We have one copy of cosine here. So this one's actually going to work out almost just like some of the other problems we saw in 7.2. So now we're going to... So let u equal sine of theta, and du is going to be cosine theta d theta. So we're going deeper down the substitution rabbit hole, so to speak, because remember we started with x's, we switched them to thetas, and now we're switching the thetas into u's. So we're going to have to backtrack out of all of this when we're done. So this integral becomes 1 fourth times 1 over u squared du. And then that's something that we can integrate using our Calc 1 techniques. So that's going to become negative 1 over 4u. I went ahead and just brought the four, 1 fourth into that antiderivative here, uh, plus c. Now let's sub back into it for theta. So that's going to be negative 1 over 4 sine of theta plus c. Okay, which we can then rewrite uh, because 1 over sine is the same thing as cosecant. So I'm just going to go ahead and do that. So that's negative cosecant theta over 4 plus c. which is looking pretty good, we just need to put it back in terms of x again. So we're going to use our triangle again. So put back in terms of x. Okay, so make the triangle. Uh, there's theta. And then what do we know? Well, we know that from our substitution, x equals 2 tangent of theta. So, uh, so let me do that right here. So x equals 2 tangent theta. So tangent theta equals x over 2. x over 2. And tangent is opposite over adjacent, so that's x and that's 2, which means that the hypotenuse is going to be the square root of x squared plus 4, which, go figure, is exactly what we had back up here at the top. That's what we were using the tangent to substitute for. So now we need cosecant. So cosecant, if sine of theta is opposite over hypotenuse, cosecant of theta, which is 1 over sine, is hypotenuse over opposite. So that's going to be cosecant of theta is hypotenuse over opposite. So we get our final answer here of negative square root x squared plus 4 over x plus c. <clears throat> All right, so we started off doing the same substitution we did before, okay, just this time using tangent because that's what that particular type of root called for. Um, we did the substitution to theta, simplified it as much as we could, got it to a form where we could use sine and cosine, and then use a u substitution. So did a u sub, put it back in terms of theta when we were done, 
and then used our trig knowledge to then put the thetas back into x's again. And that got us that final answer. Okay. So now, let's look at one more. And this time we're going to bring in some bounds. Okay. So we can see how this impacts when we're dealing with a definite integral. So first thing I want to look at is that denominator. So notice this looks a little different than what we've encountered before but it is still something that we can work with. So, so note, we have the 4x squared plus 9 to the 3 halves power. That is the same thing as the square root of 4x squared plus 9 cubed. So we can still do a substitution in there, inside that root, and then we'll just end up cubing whatever we get, and that's okay. So this has, has a form. So each term in here has to be a perfect square for this to work, and everything in there is a perfect square, but we're, I'm just going to write it in a way that makes it look a little more like what we're used to. Okay, so we get the quantity 2x squared plus 3 squared. All right, that's what's within that radical. So because we're using addition, right, a sum of two squares here, we're going to use the same one we just did. We're still going to use the tangent. Okay, so, uh, so we still use tangent. But, because the tangent formula is written like this, okay, so a value would be 3 in this case, but it's not just x here that's being squared, it's 2x. So we're going to have to accommodate for that in our formula. So, this is with 2x instead of x. So, we get the formula 2x equals 3 tangent theta instead of just x equals 3 tangent of theta. Okay, so if we solve for x then we get x equals 3 halves times tangent of theta so then our dx value is going to be 3 halves secant squared of theta d theta. Okay, so that's our substitution that we're going to be making. So then when we get to the root, we have 4x squared plus 9 inside that square root. This is going to be 4 times 3 halves tangent squared theta plus 9. Oops, I wrote that wrong. Sorry, let me. That square should be over that entire object, not just the tangent. So 4 times 3 halves tangent theta quantity squared plus 9. There we go. Okay, so when you square this, you get 9 over 4. Okay, so the 4s are actually going to cancel. And what you're going to be left with is 9 tangent squared theta plus 9, which, just like the previous one, right, you'd factor out the 9, you get tangent squared plus 1 is secant squared, so you get 3 absolute value of secant, which just becomes 3 secant of theta, just like we had before. Okay, now the next step that we're going to do that's going to also set this one a little bit apart is because this one has bounds, if we finish the problem, we would then have to go back to x values just like we have been. However, 
Instead of doing that, since we know that we're just going to get a numerical value with these bounds, let's just convert the bounds now, and then we don't have to go back to x later. So convert the bounds. Convert the bounds. So we don't have to go back to x. Okay, so first bound, the lower bound is when x equals 0, theta is going to be using this substitution and solving for theta. That's going to be inverse tangent of 0, which is 0. Okay. And then when x equals 3 root 3 over 2, theta equals inverse tangent, right, so this formula, I would multiply this so I would actually get a two-thirds in front of that x. The two-thirds would cancel with the three-halves, so all I would be left with is the root three inside of that inverse tangent. An inverse tangent of root three is actually pi over three. It's a value that we, we can get. So, we haven't even started doing the integral yet, we've just been doing a lot of setup, but the setup is going to make our lives easier when it gets down to it and solving this integral. So, we made our substitution, Okay, we got rid of the root, and we got rid of the x bounds, so we don't have to go back to x anymore once we make the switch to theta. Okay, so, let's, let's do this, we're ready to integrate now. Okay, so we have the integral from 0 to 3 root 3 over 2 of x cubed over 4x squared plus 9 to the 3 halves dx equals integral from 0 to pi over 3. Uh, x cubed is... 3 halves tangent theta quantity cubed, so that's going to be uh, something kind of ugly. So uh, 3 cubed is 27 over 2 cubed is 8 times tangent cubed over that quantity to the 3 halves. So we got that the root was... 3 secant squared, or excuse me, just 3 secant, All right? So the root is 3 secant, but this is the root cubed. So it's going to be 3 secant quantity cubed. So this is going to be uh, 3 cubed is 27, times secant cubed. And then our d theta value was 3 halves secant squared. Theta, d theta. Okay, so once we get this, now we can try to get some cancellation happening here. So this has a 27 in the numerator, and this is a 27 in the denominator. Those are actually going to cancel. And then all we're left with is a 3 over 2 and a 1 over 8. So that's going to be 3 over 16, which I'm just going to pull out altogether. Just get it out of the way. Integral from 0 to pi over 3. And then we have secant squared over secant cubed. 
So two of those factors are going to cancel. So we're just left with tangent cubed theta over secant theta d theta. And then let's do what we did last time where we converted to sine and cosine. Oops. So we have 3 sixteenths, 0 to pi over 3. So tangent cubed is sine cubed over cosine cubed over 1 over cosine which is the same thing as times cosine over 1. So just doing a little quick, this is kind of the mental math that goes behind this. So we end up with sine cubed theta over cosine squared theta d theta. Right. And then we're going to play around with this trigonometrically um, until we can get something that we can do a substitution for. So we've got our integral. I'm going to go ahead and pull out one of the extra factor of sine. So this is going to be sine squared theta over cosine squared theta uh, times sine of theta d theta. If you remember from the last section, it's always nice to have that one extra factor of either sine or cosine that's going to allow us to do a u substitution here. So I get 3 sixteenths integral 0 to pi over 3. Sine squared is 1 minus cosine squared theta over cosine squared theta times sine of theta d theta. And now we're going to do a u substitution. Because we have it established pretty clearly which is going to be u and which one's going to be du. So we're going to let u be cosine of theta. And then du is going to be negative sine theta d theta. And then while we're at it, so we don't have to go back to thetas anymore, don't have to worry about that triangular conversion, let's convert the bounds into u values as well. All right, that's just one less step we have to do later. So when theta is 0, u is cosine of 0, which is 1. And when theta is pi over 3, u is cosine of pi over 3, which is 1 half. So separate that work off there. So, and you might be wondering, hey, wait a second, why is the upper bound now a smaller value? Um, sometimes that's just how it goes when you're doing substitutions like this. Um, the substitution knows what it's doing. So if it's switching the, like the, um, which bound is higher than the other, um, it's still going to give you the correct value, okay, regardless of how you, how you do that. Okay, so let's go ahead and continue this integral down here. So we're going to get 3 sixteenths, uh, 0, excuse me, converting to u now, from 1 to 1 half, of 1 minus u squared over u squared and then times negative 1 du right because it's negative sine theta and we have a positive sine theta so it brings in a negative so this is I'm gonna pull the negative out negative 3 sixteenths integral from 1 to 1 half of, and then we can go ahead and split this up, 1 over u squared minus u squared over u squared, which is just 1, du. And now we finally make it to a point where it's an integral that we can use our calculus, our calc 1 techniques to solve. So we get negative 1 over u minus u. 
And because we put in the work earlier to convert the bounds a couple of times, we can just evaluate these bounds directly because they're in terms of u, not theta and not x. So we get negative 3 sixteenths, and we get negative 1 over 1 half, so that's negative 2 minus 1 half minus uh, negative 1 minus 1, which is going to, if you solve that out, gives us 3 over 32 is the value of that integral. Whew. All right. So that was some pretty heavy-duty integration that we just did there. So um, again, it's kind of hard to remember what we were doing at the beginning of this problem, but let's backtrack just a second. We recognize the form of the integrand is something we can do a trig substitution on. We make the substitution appropriately, okay, use that to convert everything into theta. We also converted the bounds into theta values as well while we're at it. Do the integration, convert everything to sines and cosines, and once it's converted, we can do a u substitution. Okay, convert the bounds again, and then once you get to this point, then it becomes calc 1 integration until you get down to your final answer. All right, very nice. So that's one thing about this section. Only three examples, but each one is pretty much a page long. So. Um, hopefully that's making sense as we're going through it, um, and that's going to bring us to the end of section 7.3. So uh, great job, everybody. Um, when we come back in the next section, we're going to be looking at a different type of integration that um, doesn't use a lot of trig. So um, you know, we'll get a little bit of a reprieve from all of this trigonometry, um, and I will talk to you all when we come back in that section in 7.4.